I need a mic check. Can you guys hear Hussein okay? Yeah, it's okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, yep. Can we do it? Um, hey, welcome. Our talk is how do we encourage repeat contributions to Drupal core? So for some of you who were around in the previous session that Kalpana over there just did, it's a similar topic, but we have a, a slightly different focus. So they were talking more about uh, people who already contribute and how to get them to sustain their contributions. What we want to talk about are the people that have started to contribute but might have only done one or two things. How do we remove some of their barriers and help them to do more and get past sort of the one, two commit credit area into the five, ten, and above? Um, I'm David Hernandez. I work for Rutgers University. David Hernandez, all one word, is my username. Uh, I've been involved in the Drupal community for about seven years now, doing a lot of different things uh, with a lot of different projects. I help organize uh, local user groups in New Jersey. I've organized sprints and Drupal camps and come to a lot of different conferences. I've been involved in the mentoring program, done some coding, uh, been involved with Drupal 8. Um, so I've met a lot of people who are in this area um, that have that one to commit or just beginners. And I've seen a lot of their frustrations. I've experienced those frustrations. Um, so I'm quite familiar with a, a lot that's going on and some of the things that I think that we can do to solve those problems. Um, so today is a core conversation. So we have a presentation we're going to go through that will not take the full hour. And what we're going to do is uh, hopefully get a lot of questions from all of you and a lot of good ideas from all of you. Uh, we're going to be pretty casual, so we'll go back and forth, but feel free if you think you have something really important to say in the middle of what we're doing. I don't mind at all if you interrupt us and give us some good feedback. Hello, I'm Hussein, and I, on D.2, I usually go with name Hussein Webb, and actually pretty much everywhere on the internet, Twitter, wherever you can find me. And uh, I have been involved in Drupal community since about two years, and uh, in that, apart from uh, co-contributions mainly to Drupal 8. I have been also working with uh, my local community back in Bangalore and uh, nearby communities, Mumbai, Delhi, various communities in India. And um, well, uh, it's really exciting to be here. It's my first Drupal con and really excited to speak here. So let's get started. So, <coughs> so I think David, yeah. This one's mine. All right. So why is it important to have repeat contributions? Um, one of the biggest reasons is obviously we need sustainability in core and in the community. Um, we have a very large user base as far as the people who have actually gotten commit credits and worked on Drupal 8. Um, almost 3,000 people now, in fact, have gotten a commit credit. So uh, we're one of, if not the largest, open source communities. Um, but we actually have a very small number of people who are doing the majority of the work, um, probably less than 100 people that are doing probably 75 to 80% of the actual work. Um, and that's not sustainable. This is what leads to burnout. Um, it leads to frustrations. Um, there's a lack of diversity in that group in a lot of different ways. Uh, we're not just talking about national diversity or racial or anything else, but even just diversity in like job functions. Um, so if we have a larger group, we get more ideas from different people who have different backgrounds, um, and we can allow those people to rest when needed and have other people take up the mantle and continue progressing Drupal. Um, that, of course, leads to community growth because when you have more people involved, you have um, a stronger user base, and you have people that will continue working with Drupal core and Drupal projects learning about Drupal and they are far more likely to stick around. Um, we're worried about um, some of the percentages of people who might work on one issue or one problem. And then if they have a bad experience, they're far more likely to come back. And it's very possible that they don't even stick around with the community because they're just getting involved with the project. They think maybe Drupal's not right for me. I'll work with something else, find where my place is, and they work with a different project. Um, and that affects adoption as well. If you have good developers who stay in the community, they will use Drupal, and they will prefer to use Drupal in all their projects. They will push their organizations to use Drupal. Um, and working on core and different projects and contributing is a great way for you to actually learn, so it affects your developer's education. Uh, I can say that I know a, a 
decent amount about Drupal 8 right now, but it's not because I use it on any projects. Very few of us have ever used it. Um, but when it gets released, I'll know a fair amount about how it works. And that's really great for my job. It's great for me personally. Um, and, but I don't know any of that without actually working and contributing. So having understood this, having understood why we need repeat contributions, so let's understand a bit more about uh, what really motivates people to contribute. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a bit of both. Uh, here we, let's, let's see, you know, what motivates a person to contribute for the first time and keep his contributions going. This is the focus of our talk, right? So in my experience, I have found people primarily start contributing to learn and uh, and by that learning become a part of this community and uh, well back in bangalore it's uh, it's really exciting not just in bangalore but in overall you know in all the camps i've been to in india um, it's it's a really exciting thing there are a lot of people who come up and ask uh, ask mainly about drupal 8 that's the focus of the moment right and how do you learn it's such a major shift and the easiest answer for this is to start working in the issue queues Right. And uh, of course, the, the word here is start. Most of those people have not started yet. And they do start. And that is the reason we see about 3,000 odd contributors right now on the project. And <coughs> sustaining it is, of course, the problem here. So to sustain, uh, education still plays a role in uh, sustaining these contributions. We don't, uh, we don't have uh, people just commit one patch and Oh yeah, I've learned Drupal eight now. It's it's mm -hmm. fine. It doesn't happen that way, right? So uh, they keep they keep at it, and those who do, uh, they, they satisfy their uh, the desire. You know that they have learned the system and they are ahead of everyone else. So that's one thing. Uh, there is of course respect, and uh, of course we we handle that with the commit mentions, and uh, so there is this layer of commit mentions, and many people are attracted to that, and that's not a bad thing, of course, and uh, with that. It makes it easier for a person to say, okay, I'm contributing. I've made just one patch, but okay, I'm there in the uh, Git log. And if I make the next one, uh, you'll see the long tail of the graph right now, and you'll jump, you'll suddenly jump, you know, way to the left of the graph, right? And make a couple of more patches, and you're, you're actually approaching the curve. Uh, so this is, again, very important for some people, and this keeps them going, you know, you know because it's uh, the benefits are so... Uh, uh, so drastic in the initial first steps, you know, writing another patch, getting it submitted, getting it committed is not that hard, but your name jumps like from maybe 2000 something to 1000 something and commit five more patches and your name is right within hundreds, I guess. Right. So, uh, th this is again, another, uh, motivation to most people. And, um, my experience, karma and altruism is not that powerful of a motivator, it is still important, and many people still feel that, uh, uh, you know, when, when we contribute for the sake of the project, for the sake of the, uh, the community, for the sake of contribution itself. Uh, but it's not a, as powerful motivator as these commit mentions and education has been. <coughs> and these, uh, um, yeah. So uh, what are some of the current problems that we see that interfere with people contributing? Um, uh, one of the biggest ones we hear from developers is obviously the complexity of our systems um, and the workflow that you have to go through in order to contribute a patch um, and the entire patch system itself, right? So you have to set up development environments, you have to make sure you have Git installed and that you know how to use it and then you do when you make simple little code edits and then you have to generate a patch and you have to generate an inner diff and know how to apply patches from other people and then upload them and make sure that it goes to the test bot and all that other sort of stuff. Um, and that can be pretty uh, overbearing and intimidating for a lot of new people and especially for non-developers, which people forget about a lot. Um, if you want to help with documentation or do some of the front end work and then you tell someone, sure, great, we have lots of things where you can do. By the way, you have to do all this exact same stuff that developers have to do. That's why they just walk out the door and never come back. Um, finding and organizing issues. Uh, if you spent a lot of time in the issue queues, you, you know that the, the issue queue is a great bug tracker. It is absolutely horrible project management tool. Um, it's not a project management tool. We have none. 
Um, we rely on a small set of fields. We can't properly prioritize. We end up using issue tags for every single thing. Um, comments get too long. Um, if you've worked on an issue that has two or three pages of comments and you want to try to figure out what's going on, it, it gets pretty impossible. Um, and then if you want to organize all that work for a larger initiative and you start using metas and child issues and before you know, you're, it's completely lost. Um, so anyone actually wants to get involved with something really significant, it's impossible to keep track of things. Um, this plays into lack of confidence. Um, we, we have a problem in the community where we have a system of knowing which means um, a lot of work gets done by the people who just know what to do. And I'm not talking about the code. I'm talking about how to navigate everything, who just know where those issues are and what that project is and what groups that Jupyter org group was used and who are the right people to talk to and what IRC channel and where the instructions are and which instructions were wrong and which ones were right and which ones worked, which ones didn't. Um, and it just becomes an intrinsic part of the stuff that you do and for a completely new person, that's impossible. And they see all of this amazing work being done by people, and when they get involved, it's not something they can do. So you, you assume that you're not going to be capable. Um, but it's really just a problem of the way we organize things. Um, then uh, lack of incentive for some people, which is a, a very real thing. I, I don't. There are a lot of people that do want to contribute, and they want to keep contributing. But it's not always realistic to expect people to do all this work on their own time, um, on weekends and at night. Uh, we see that obviously happens a lot, and that's that's really what we get from those people that are at the top of that chart, um, that they're doing a, a significant amount of work on their own. Um, we need to find ways to incentivize organizations to allow people to do work on work time. Uh, because I honestly I've gotten to the point where when I talk to people and they say, I, I, if I can't do it during work hours, I'm not going to do it. And I say, that's fine. Like, I'm not going to tell you, you should be doing that. I, I think that's completely, it's, it's wrong for us to tell people that, that you should work on something on the weekend or take holidays and come to a sprint or do something, you know, that should be your personal time. Um, and we do sometimes have problems with decision-making, which can be pretty demoralizing. Um, we have a, oftentimes in areas we have a very loose structure for how things get done and what's decided, and it's not clear, especially for newer people, who has to talk to whom, um, who's going to make that decision, what solutions are going to be used, what isn't. And if you've ever seen or had the experience where you work on an issue and you spend a lot of time on it, and then eventually when it finally gets to the right person, they go, well, no, we're not going to do this, and they shut it down. I'm sorry you spent 20 hours working on that, but, you know, oh, well. Um, it's not as clear um, for especially new people how to handle that situation. The experienced people will know, if I'm going to work on this, I'm going to talk to this person. Uh, but when you're new and you're trying to do things on your own, that's an impossible expectation. And we see that all the time, right? I, when I've mentored in uh, these various sprints, uh, people are generally very, very afraid to update an issue. You know, it's, uh, should, I, should I add this tag? What do I do about this tag? You know, what is this tag about? Or, you know, what, what should I set, this, set the status? You know, what, what about this priority? And comments can be overwhelming, you know, the way it has been done so far. And uh, regional differences do play into this a bit. Uh, for example, uh, when you're reading through an issue, uh, you know, we generally find people from North America and Europe doing the most of the talking. And uh, when a person from India or I guess surrounding regions as well comes in and sees the uh, sees the kind of uh, discussion happening, they immediately feel intimidated. It's uh, first of all the code base is very new. Uh, most of these people are familiar with Drupal seven, Drupal six environments, and uh, the overall style of programming you have now, you know, the, the modern PHP programming, the Drupal 8 and everything. And on, on top of this, the, the style of discussion, it gets a bit overwhelming. And of course, you know, you can't do much about the, the coding style that's here to stay, of course. And that's a good thing. I mean, uh, no complaints there. Uh, the, the solution here is to find ways around this. Find, uh, well, of course, you know, we, we, have, uh, we have to make sure we have enough mentors at the sprint. Uh, we have to make sure we uh, the mentors uh, make people comfortable. 
and we are seeing some progress there, especially in India, in the recent sprints. So, um, well, uh, with all these problems in mind, let's let, let's look at some data we have collected from uh, Drupal.org. Uh, Ryan, as I, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. Uh, he built uh, these queries for us to go through this data, and uh, I'm guessing this pie chart is, of course, you know, I'm, I'm assuming most of you are familiar with this pie chart. Um, it basically says uh, it breaks down the number of commit messages uh, your me your name mentions in all the commit messages in Drupal 8. Um, so the the whole half of the pie chart you see on the left, the blue one, that's people with just one commit. So uh, 3,000 odd people. And uh, half of that are just people with one commit. And the other, well, other two-thirds of it, around 40%, that's people with just two to ten commits. The next step, you know. And people who have actually become comfortable with this repeat, uh, with contributions, and they're repeating, them, uh, repeating contributions now, that's just 13% you see in yellow. So I just, uh, just for the sake of curiosity, uh, which pie chart would you place yourself in? Blue, red, or yellow? Blue, anyone in blue here? Blue, red, red, okay, and yellow? Okay, so, well, of course, the discussion, <laughs> the talk is this, but I mean, if, if, I, if I'm going to conduct this You're all yellow, the... talk over, let's go home. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, I solved all the problems. Yeah, so uh, do this over the entire uh, attendance at DrupalCon, and uh, well, of course, you know, we'll start seeing this exact pattern play out. Uh, one thing to notice over here is just the size. You know, the, uh, this is just a pie chart, it shows percentages. Uh, but the number itself, 3,000, it's actually more than the attendance at this DrupalCon. And uh, we'll not go, we'll not delve too deep into the mechanics of you know what that what that number means and what it means to the attendance at DrupalCon, but it's just something to think about. We have a lot of contributors, and even if we think that DrupalCon has a large attendance, it's not nearly as large enough as our prospective uh, contributor base. So, please leave it. Yeah, so this is the, the long tail graph that people have probably seen before. Joris has had it several times in his um, keynotes before. Um, I, we stole this directly from XJM in her blog post. Um, if you were here at the, the talk before this, you've seen this exact same chart. I know you have because I stole it directly out of Kalpana's presentation because I have access to Google. Um, <clears throat> but this is you know kind of a representation of the, the chart essentially we were looking at before where we see that only a handful of people have the most commit mentions and there's a very, very, very fast drop off where it levels out near one and two. Um, so what we want to do is work on bringing that curve up. Um, in the previous talk, they were talking about sort of that middle area, and in our talk today, we're talking about the tail, right? So how do we elevate that tail from having so many people just being one or two commit mentions and um, have a more gradual slope so that we can progress people from this first stage to the second stage of how they contribute? Okay, so with that in mind, uh, we started delving deep into the data. And, uh, and of course, there are so many dimensions to consider here. So one dimension in particular which we uh, considered was uh, that we get the person to start participating in the issue queues and they probably make a comment, right? How much time does it take uh, for that person to go ahead and submit a patch? And uh, we found on average it takes about 112 days. Uh, this is this is based out of all the 3,000 contributors we have. It's averaged on that. No, it's actually it's more than that. It's actually all active accounts on Drupal.org. So from the first time you commented ever on an issue to the first time you ever made a patch, the average was 112 days. Yep. Um, and so we were thinking, if this actually plays into the you know if this actually factors into the uh, the repeat contribution. So uh, the idea is, you know, if we improve this number, if we make it easier for the uh, for a person to uh, get uh, get uh, started with his first patch, does it encourage him to uh, contribute uh, repeatedly? And our answer was, not really. Uh, 
from what you see in the chart, it's it's actually a log- logarithmic charge, uh, chart. If if I normalize it, it'll look very much like that long tail chart we have been seeing. But uh, this actually uh, distributes the data for us to consider, and you can see that uh, most of the patches, uh, you know, actually the pat uh, the patches, the red dots you see on the y-axis, on you know when the time between first commit and first patch is zero. Uh, and these are the patches which are probably done during sprints, you know, mentored sprints and all that. Uh, they they have a good enough chance to start uh, repeating contributions. So we have, you know, like you see, we have one dot ne- nearing 100, right? But everybody else is kind of evenly distributed from two to nine. That's like two, f- two figures, like about 100 seconds to few days. And uh, well, this chart kind of makes it a little bit more clear uh, I, I, I hope, <laughs> uh, but it's the, the size of the circles are basically the number of commits that uh, that data point represents, and again it's evenly distributed. There's no conclusion here, which actually the, the conclusion here is that there is no relevance. So uh, this is one one area where we can say that okay, we don't ha- really have to focus here, <clears throat> and uh, we move on to another dimension, and uh, it's this. Uh, David, you yeah. want to be. So this was actually, uh, we analyzed the time from when someone uploaded a patch to the time when um, another active account basically left a comment. So it's what we're using to sort of estimate how long it takes to get some kind of review on that patch. And what we found is for, uh, and this is, uh, the data points here are for individuals. So what we found is it matches that long tail. Um, So if you or someone that has a lot of patches and you contribute the most, your wait time to get a review is lower than anyone else. And all the people who have just one or two patches, their wait times are extremely long. Um, and it, like as we said, it matches almost perfectly, um, that long tail. So um, this is probably the key point that we really want to work on. And I think we all knew that this is one of the problems, waiting for reviews, and I think that just sort of confirms that uh, especially for newer contributors, uh, this is a, a extremely significant problem. Yep. Yeah, what? Peter? Yeah. Uh, my, my there is a microphone in the middle. <laughs> so so I, I just want to make a comment about cause and effect here because I remember <laughs> being early, well, when I first started contributing, I had this experience also that, like, you would post a patch and basically it, you, it would never get a response. Um, and having a eureka moment of, like, going on RSC or getting connected people and being able to directly, you know, at least have a conversation with people or ask for a review was when things got reviewed quickly. So, <laughs> you know, I think it, it, it probably reflects the interconnectedness of those contributors as opposed to that people are looking at their issues specifically even. Oh, definitely. Uh, Yeah, I don't think we're trying to draw that conclusion. Uh, I think it's exactly that. It's more of an issue where if you are an experienced contributor, you know who to talk to. You're probably working on active issues. You know exactly what are the right issues to work on. You're probably doing it at sprints and different events. You can go on IRC and say, hey, look at my issue, or you're working directly with someone. Whereas if you're a new contributor and you might be someone completely random, that's just doing things on their own, you don't know any of these things. And that's that problem that problem of knowing that I discussed earlier. Um, and you also don't know that you should just go and harass people and get them to look at your issues or whatever. Hi. So I'm Kathy. So I thought exactly the same thing as Peter when I saw this graph. I'm like, wow, we need to be really careful about cause and effect here. But then I really liked the comment that David said which was, this is a problem. So whether or not it's a cause or an effect, it is a problem that our first-time contributors are having to wait this long. Um, So it's really nice to actually see this data. Thank you. Yeah, it's demoralizing for people. And this is one of the things that we're worried about. Um, A lot of these people are probably the ones that uh, may leave and not come back because... we tell them, hey, come work with us, be a part of the community, work on issues, and they work on something, and they don't hear back from anyone or get any reviews for weeks or months, and they just leave, and they don't do it again. It's, it's actually pretty astounding. Uh, the, the topmost dot on the y-axis you see 
that's that works out to months you know the patch was posted and was committed months later so it's it's something it's definitely a problem area and something we need to work on yeah there's there are some data points where someone is a new contributor they uploaded a patch and it's been years and no one has ever looked at that issue so what is the likelihood that that person's going to do it again Hi, I'm John Shortis, and something that I noticed as a sprint mentor last year is is exactly this, the the demoralize, de demoralizing effect of, I mean, not necessarily not having instant gratification, but even sitting there in the room and it being hard for a new contributor to get a, a review. Uh, but something that I just thought of, we've now got that new user tag, and, you know, just that could be something or other equivalent metadata on the user profile. Yeah, that's actually that something that I – that I, it was an idea that I got from Ryan Aslett when we were, we were going through some of this data because we have the new user tag. And so he was suggesting like, hey, maybe we can do something like add a tag when someone uploads their patch and said this was the first patch this person uploaded or, you know, cool things like that in the issue queue and then people will notice it. Um, and they're more likely because we we usually are very good about doing those things when we are notified about it. Exactly. Like when and the I community role stuff came out, everyone was like, "Hey, this is a great community role," and like they'll go and click the button and help people, and they'll see that someone's a new user and they'll be nice to them and all that kind of stuff. I think if there were more triggers for those kinds of things, it would improve things. But we'd have to say, uh, but yeah, those are great ideas. Yeah, and also uh, for example, uh, you mentioned mentoring at sprints, right? And another problem I have seen uh, is to explain to people that, okay, you're coming here, you're working on an issue, updating issue summaries, or making a patch, but your patch is not going to get committed today. You're, you're working on the patch today, but it's going to go into review, and that might take days, it might take months, and it's difficult to explain to the user that, you know, do this today and reap the benefits weeks later. And this... Uh, this is a little tricky to deal with. Uh, personally, I, I would say that, uh, you, you know, a kind of a mentor outreach program where mentor knows, for example, it's, it's all a knowledge problem here. You know, people don't know where to, uh, who to talk to. And so if mentors, if there is a channel where mentors can get in, uh, get in touch with the, uh, the maintainers of the, of the project, it actually helps make a difference. And, I know there is such a channel, it's always there, uh, but uh, I find very few people use it. And again, it's not just the contributors who are new, it's the mentors as well who are new over here. And that's another problem. That's entirely another pro problem that we need to deal with. Yeah, that's a really wise thing, like you were saying, uh, that you have the mentors at Sprints explain to the new contributors um, what will happen next and then it could be a long time to wait to get in a review and that helps uh, mitigate some of their frustration by making sure their expectations are in line with reality. Yes. So that's a good idea. I don't know that we've ever done that. So maybe we can um, we could learn from that and do that here. This um, when you were talking about, you know, maybe adding a tag, we don't have to add a tag for these um, uh, issues. So if we no, I don't know, mean adding no, a so tag. We, so wait, so we know we ha we know which users are new because yes. we ha they're new, right? And there's already an issue in the issue queue to change Drupal.org so that our advanced search we can restrict to like um, uh, the date of the last patch that was uploaded. So if we can get our advanced search table of issues to um, say only show me the issues from new contributors and sort by the date of the last patch, that's our mentor issue queue. And, yes. and mentors don't have to maintain their own list of issues they want to return to. They were like, oh, I know this new contributor did some work on this. I need to check back on this later. And then they have to figure out how they're going to maintain this list of thing, right? And nobody knows what it is, but if we can do this query with like a database or something, like, and maybe, you know, some kind of interface to the data, mm -hmm. <laughs> then we have, like, 
people will be like, you know, I want to mentor new people. Well, this is how you do it. You yes. go to this thing, and it's just like, here, they, here are the patches from the new people. Review them. Like, it would be so amazing. Yeah, that would be great. Yes. We, we do yeah. also have to be mindful, though, that it wouldn't, wouldn't be the same query just for new people because we have to check um, that their patch count. It's not the age of their account. Because someone can have an, a user account that's five years old, and this is the first time they've uploaded a patch. Yeah, I think somebody needs to make an issue for this so we can. We'll talk to Ryan. Make document this <laughs> idea, but there's definitely, I think, a way to automate this. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, definitely. yeah. And just to uh, to echo something that Kathy just said, uh, I think setting up, I think these DrupalCon sprints can be setting up false expectations because I talked to someone who, yeah, she had her first patch committed live on stage at DrupalCon a few years ago. Second patch waited for months. So I think <laughs> just a better job of mentors, but in general, <laughs> sprints are not the way things usually happen. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just an education issue. Yeah, I'm very big on um, managing expectations. And I tell people that if you, you know, when we go to sprints, if you want to be successful and have a good sprint, make sure that everybody accomplishes something. But be realistic about what that something is. So for some people, it might just be commenting. It might be uploading a patch, but that's it. Like, that's the end. Or getting their dev environment set up and make sure they at least do something and they know what that something is. No. Yeah, I don't like when people show up and they think, okay, I'm going to help out and I'm going to solve a bunch of problems and they're all going to get fixed and committed right now. And when I leave, everything's going to be way better than it was when I came. Like, that doesn't happen. And that, again, leads to some of that demoralization where people have these lofty expectations. They don't get met, so they don't feel good about the experience. Uh, you know, just apart from managing expectations, I would like to add that uh, we could definitely work on finding a way to incentivize this. You know, commit mention is, of course, the definite incentive when everything is done and ready. You know, the patches, the issue is closed. But even before that, if we find uh, if we find a way to incentivize, just the act of uploading a patch or act of reviewing, and I, I think, uh, of course, that that's in works. Uh, for example, the data we have collected, the number of patches you see is not the number of commit mentions on the on the x-axis. So uh, it goes up to. 3,000, I'd say. I think the largest, uh, the, the topmost contributor right now has about uh, 1,300 commit mentions, but the number of patches are about 3,000. And so we have that data. And if we can use this data to incentivize this, you know, like for example, you know, top of my head, I can think of like a badge, you know, 3,000 plus patches. It's something which is immediate. You know, a, a person won't have to wait until the end of uh, end of the entire issue cycle to see the benefits out of his contribution. Yeah. And by the way, the number of patches that Drace has uploaded is one. So we need to find a way to incentivize him to upload more <laughs> patches. Who needs version control? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. <laughs> I have a question, which is, no, do you have any more slides? Yes, do you yes, have more slides? Yes, we then, do. And then we should have our questions. We haven't gotten to some oh. of our solutions. <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 we should. <laughs> okay, so we have already spoken about this. <laughs> well, okay. So let's start with discussing what we're already good at, right? So... Recruitment is one area our sprints are doing a great job. Uh, and uh, they're generally good at getting more people in. And that's that explains the long tail, right? You know, the, peop the people with just one or two commits, uh, commit mentions. Uh, it explains that. So we are good there. And interest, and that's building up. Uh, back home, back in India, uh, there are a lot of organizations taking an active interest in supporting contributions. Uh, for example, I can use my own example here because Accelerant, the organization I work for, uh, uh, pays me to contribute. I, I do this contributions on working time. And I know of many other organizations, small and large, who do the exact same thing. I, uh, as a local uh, organizer, I've been approached by many organizations, and when we organize camps, 
the most common question is how do we get started with contributions? So there is definite interest. Ability is there. Ability as in, you know, the technical skills. You know, you, you can write PHP code. You can understand. You can debug. You can build a system. So that ability is there. That's not a problem. And motivation again. Motivation in the sense of a person wanting to contribute, the desire, again, ties into the interest. So all, all this are there. You know, we don't have to work on these. But we have to improve the workflow and... Yeah, so some of the things that we're trying to do, um, which um, improve the tools that are used for contributing, um, especially for developers, um, one thing that's hopefully coming this year that Ryan Aslett is working on, mentioning his name again, Mixologic, is um, bringing this concept of issue workspaces to Drupal.org. Um, and this involves uh, Git namespacing, um, and it brings essentially a pull request like system to um, Drupal.org so we can kind of get away from this patch workflow that we have now. Um, if you've been to any of his presentations that he's given about that already, it's like standing ovation type stuff where everyone's like, yeah, this is going to be the most awesome thing ever. Yeah, and that's why I put that link up there. Unfortunately, his, he's actually giving that talk right now. Um, so uh, do check that out later. It's all recorded. Um, I'm sure he'll be giving that talk again at some point. Um, and all of his information will be online. Uh, he has some nice, really good charts and workflows and awesomeness. And um, you will hopefully, after DrupalCon Los Angeles, start seeing some of those issues pop up um, on the Drupal.org project uh, queue uh, where he's going to begin doing the work. Um, and what I'm really excited about, probably even more so than the pull request stuff, is that along with this, become uh, we're going to get in-browser editing. Um, and that is, I think, the most enormous part for getting people like front-end developers and documentation people and people who just want to fix really small things and one-line changes. And even reviewers, because there's a lot of times when you review a patch and you see something really small, and you're like, oh, you, you have to just fix this comment or there's a typo here or something. And then you leave the comment and tell them to fix it because you don't feel like downloading the patch, spinning up your development environment, applying it, making this one line change, making another patch, an inner diff, uploading it, doing all that work. If you have the, the, the in browser editor, we can just do it straight away and go done. Um, another thing that we've talked about doing um, that I've been privy to, and I'm not sure if I'm supposed to actually talk about it, um, are the <laughs> is this initiative concept? that the DA staff has been talking about adding to Drupal.org, which is, um, it, I don't think they've um, fleshed out the software yet, but it may essentially be bringing organic groups on the Drupal.org and then using it as an, a, an actual project management tool so that you can build a group, um, you can add issues to that group. People who are responsible for them can sort the issues any way they want, collect whatever issues they want, um, set up meetings, post documentation, do all that sort of stuff, and just keep it in one generalized issue area. And subscribe to the group so that when the group has updates, you get notified so that you don't have to magically know that somebody made an issue about something somewhere. Um, again, reducing that knowingness that you have to do. Um, if that gets added, um, I think that will... That will help a lot, especially for the initiatives, and we can possibly start ditching like these meta issues and all this other stuff that gets done. Um, and then the governance changes, or not so much changes, but the refinement that happened recently. So if you go to this node, 2457875, it's where the core committers recently did a lot of work to sort of flesh out um, their structure and decision making and their roles, um, and doing something like uh, adding a bunch of tags that are necessary to get like committer feedback and specific committer feedback. So if you're not familiar, the committers themselves actually have specific roles. So there's a, a release manager. You're the, Jesse, the release manager. You and Catch, uh, there's the product manager, the framework managers, the benevolent dictator, all that sort of stuff. But we can start using a tag where we say, hey, we need feedback from this person because we're about to do something and it needs sign off, right? So we can start avoiding those issues where someone spends a lot of time working on something and then 
they didn't know the right person or they didn't get feedback, we can tag it and say, hey, I need your feedback on this as soon as possible. Yes, so with this, with uh, the initiatives, uh, what uh, David just described, uh, with with that in place, we can actually start solving the final problem over here, final as we see it right now, uh, of matching people with their interests. It's it's of course it's uh, right now it's a little difficult to find issues that you might want to work on. I personally like to work on issues related to base system, and uh, either I, I would have to go to that uh, filter, go to the advanced search, and filter on that component every day, or some, if I just have to follow this initiative and I would be notified of anything happening over there and make sure that, oh, okay, you know, there's a new version of Symphony out. Should I, should I work on that? That, that you, we, you solve these problems. And again, with this, we start categorizing our issues better, not just the, the single layer of tags, but, uh, you know, the, the groups, which is basically what we're calling as initiatives. And with that, we know, okay, I know I'll be, uh, I'll be involved in the base system group base system initiative and if there is any issue that comes up, like you just said, you know, I would know about it. I would be able to stay abreast with it. And this, this can definitely help make it easier for people to continue, contribu continue contributing even on the longer cycle, you know, once they have gone past that 10 commits or 50 commits stage, it makes it easier. Yeah, anytime we, uh, step number one in mentoring when people show up, what do you always do? You ask them, well, what are you interested in? And I don't think anyone has ever said PHP. <laughs> no, they say, well, I'm, you know, I'm interested in this, doing front end stuff, or I'm interested in like this, you know, this, you know, UX or, or something like that. And it's, well, okay, choose this particular subsystem or component, hit, <laughs> hit save. Yeah. <laughs> oh, your front end developer, choose theme system and then go through the 500 PHP problems that are involved in that subsystem and see if we could find a few that might involve CSS or something, maybe, possibly, I don't know. Good luck, I'll see you in four hours and maybe you found something. Um, but if we can keep people, um, if people can more directly get to their interest groups and um, get in touch with the people who are also interested in those areas and they can see things like these are the particular issues in the queue that are related to this subject matter and these are the people that are working on it and there are meetings and there's documentation and everything. Um, it's, I would hate to say this, the sort of like reversed web thing that Dries talks about, but like if you want to go to an area and actually have it pushed to you instead of you having to search for it, right, that would actually help things. Yes. Yep. Jazz hands. <laughs> I'm waiting for a drone to show up and give me issues. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, and, uh, yeah, we've been talking about this the whole time, but greater recognition for people and the work that they do. We're getting pretty good at getting developers' recognition. Um, commit credits and things like that, but we're always talking about commit credits, which um, are not always important to people. Um, people who do reviews should get credit, and that's not necessarily a commit credit. Um, people who are doing it can, but we, I want something more granular than that. I don't want to just say this developer got 10 commit credits and then you did reviews and got 10 commit credits. I want to know who's doing the reviews. I want to know who's a top 10 reviewer or who's the, the top three reviewers in this subsystem um, or who's doing the most UX work in this particular area or design work or whatever it is. We don't, we don't do that now. Um, and, um, and giving public recognition for people. So this is something we've talked about with like badges for organizations or the top 10 organization. We should, you know, find ways to um, get people that credit as well. Um, we, you'll see a lot of things now where people like tweet congratulations for your commerce, first commit credit, stuff like that. You know, that kind of thing is really great. And we need like more sustained efforts like that. Um, and that gives people karma. Um, it gives them good feelings about the experience. Um, and it, um, incentivizes them to continue and feel belonged. Just as an example here, uh, when we hit the 2500th two commit milestone, uh, WebCheck tweeted about that. Uh, I don't remember the name of the committer, uh, the contributor here. It was actually me, it wasn't WebCheck. 
Oh, it was you? Oh, it was XJM. <laughs> okay, I'm going to be in trouble for that. But okay. Her name was Tadi Char and she was, she's a, a student contributor. And she was yeah. like 25. And that was my tweet. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, I got the names mixed up. Sorry about that. But yeah, now I see more and more contributions, more and more patches uploaded by that user. And uh, this could be a coincidence, but I think not. That initial encouragement actually <coughs> actually made sure that you know that person uh, she she stuck onto the she stuck onto her contributions. And I think well, a tweet for everyone. I, I don't know if that sounds practical. We can think about it, but <laughs> um, I think it might be possible if we knew whether it was their first commit or not, right? If then, then that type something. I'm, I'm sorry. Actually, yeah, I'm sure we it. could do it. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, definitely my emphasis on this is things besides code, right? There is a lot of work that goes on in the Drupal community. I mean, like, you do project reviews, right? How much recognition do you get for that? Do we know how much, how, you know, what your count is of reviews and how many hours you've put into it? And okay. it's just, you know, and nobody talks about it, Right. Um, it would be nice if we had all that data compiled and would actually display it on user pages and give people credit for it so that there's, you know, there's an equal playing field for people who are doing things besides just getting commit credits for core. It, this actually opens up a whole new, uh, whole new category of contributors who are not comfortable with code but who can go and update issue queues. Uh, and that's very much needed. <laughs> right? Yeah, I want to know who are the top ten writers not just editing documentation, but like blog posts. <coughs> so then we can contact those people and tell them to write more things. <laughs> <laughs> Who are the top ten typo fixers? <laughs> push, the, push that information to me. <laughs> okay, so one, one thing that I would, this is Lucas Heading, H-E-D-D-N uh, -E on Drupal.org. Um, I think that as we, I, I think critical to all this is being able to, and it's a constant thing. So I do IRC mentoring on, on Wednesdays. Uh, let's get some of the other introductory remarks out there. So I do IRC uh, mentoring on Wednesdays. And what, what's our constant sort of internal feedback every three months is, hey, you know what? We should probably get more of these folks that are coming on a regular basis to be able to find their own stuff. And then two months go by, and then you know what? We should really get folks that have been coming here regularly to find their own stuff. Why is it so hard? I feel like I'm a matchmaker, right? I'm, I'm matching up Jane with John, right? We're finding issues for folks. Why is it so hard to find stuff? I, I think part of it is our so growth. So let me, let me come, with, let oh, me come okay. up with a, a suggestion here. Um, I want to find easy stuff that folks can get a success on. Even if they don't get a commit mention, at least they got a patch uploaded in their... 45 to hour and a half stretched long lunch break. Or maybe they did it before the kids or after the kids went to bed, right? <clears throat> that means I need to know what novice tag novice tagged yes. things are, but I can't just look for novice tagged things. I need to look for, and, 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 and this is my soapbox, we need to know patches that and, and the dates for when patches have been uploaded. Because if I don't know that, and I need to know it's a .patch file, not a .jpeg, I need to know this information so I can do a reverse search and look for something that's three years old. Or run that search around. And, and I can play with the data now. I've got mm -hmm. the information exposed to me so that I can look for something that's been tagged as novice and that's in that sweet spot of five weeks old. So it's not so terribly complicated to 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 look at and try to figure out what's going on and re-roll the patch. Anyone ever pick up a JavaScript patch that's three years old and try to apply it? Ain't going to work. You need something that's about five weeks old. And, okay, soapbox. We need this information. We need to make it easier for folks to get into the issue queue and and find stuff for themselves and and, and, and jump in there on their own and get successful without having to be. Yeah, I mean, we, we have a big problem, and it's in a way a good problem, is that we've, we've grown a lot. Um, 
we've grown a huge amount, but it's just that our tools have not grown with us. I guess I have a little bit of a question here in the sense that I know everybody's really focused on. Wait, before you go for a question, next slide. Yeah, I'm okay. sorry. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> I know everybody's really focused on cutting down the time between patch review and commit, but you know, one of the things that I struggle with every day, just like in my everyday job, is, is understanding when something's actionable, right? So sometimes a patch sits for a really long time because it's not a really important patch, but it was something that somebody had time to do and it was little and it was unimportant, right? So that's not necessarily by itself a sign of a problem. I mean, sometimes the whole world worry about agile programming is that you're supposed to be developing issues so that you can figure out from the lay of the land how you might do something as you go and the low priority chunk of something you want to scoop in and do it when the time is right. And so I guess one of the core questions that I have is, to, I mean, for me, it's like right now I'm scratching my own itch about something that I think is really important for the, for the, for the future of Drupal and stuff like that. But the last thing that I want to be doing is taking all these people who are already the barriers and roadblocks to, to Drupal 8 being released and jam them full of issues that need to be triaged or patches that they need to decide and review their commit that is somebody's little personal itch that isn't really inside the, the, the core kind of release blocker thing, right, from that perspective. So it's like I want people to be folk to increase the contribution of the stuff that matters. And so looking at fringe stuff in a product this big and this old, it kind of worries me about, well, you know, are we really focusing on the right thing? It's like to what extent are we focusing on, on the important stuff that needs more resources and connecting that with the people who – have resources to give versus just saying, you know what, we just want to reward people because we want to increase the volume of contributors because growth mm -hmm. is not necessarily a measure of success, right? right. right? So uh, to this, I, I would say that, that there, there are really two things here. So first thing is, of course, uh, the problem is that uh, we need new contributors. We need them. And the the tie-in problem over here is that the the problem of incentivization. Okay, now right now the way incentivizing <coughs> a contribution works is ultimately when everything is said and done, and when the issue is committed and you get your name in the git commit message. And this is what discourages people. So if you find a middle ground, say that you know not the number of commit mentions but the number of patches you have uploaded. Okay, hold this, on a second. This, so. Um, you mentioned that earlier, and we need to not do that. It's really, really dangerous to incentivize the number of patches. And in fact, we're already doing that by incentivizing the number of commit mentions. And one mm -hmm. thing we do not need is people who are like, I'm going to like make 50 patches on 50 issues. It will kill us all. Mm -hmm. um, and there's already, I see, um, I see sprints that happen and then the sprints are like uh, celebrating their successes, right? So they write a blog post, they make tweets, and they're like, we had the most successful sprint ever. We had 50 patches put up on the issue queue. And I'm like, oh my God, no, please. You needed to have four patches put up on the issue queues and 20 reviews done. So if we're going to do, I like your idea of incremental uh, recognition that we shouldn't have to wait for commit mentions. I'm with you on that. But the way that we do it is on reviews, not on patches. Okay. We ignore the number of patches that people make. We don't have to incentivize anybody to make more patches. We have plenty of them. What we okay. don't have is reviews. Um, so contributions in general, yeah. And we need to figure out so, reviews. Yeah. So Well, um, reviews or fixes. I know fixes is a longer term. Reviews. The, and uh, I share your concern Old issues that haven't been touched in a while probably aren't worth touching again. So we shouldn't devote a bunch of resources to getting them reviews. If we can 
we can do this in, in two different ways. Uh, but if we can do like um, David was talking about these groups, these initiatives, and the initiatives can prioritize issues, then when new contributors are coming, mm -hmm. they are working on the issues that the initiative leaders have identified as currently important at this time. They'll never work on these issues that we, okay, not never. They'll be less likely to work on these issues we don't care about. So that will help solve that problem also. Yeah, we started There's for for the front end stuff in, at our last Twig meeting. We made a Google Doc of all the stuff that we're going to start working on while we're here in Los Angeles because I'm tired of going through issue queues looking for things. So when right. someone comes to me, I'm looking at that Google Doc and saying, here, you work on this. Yeah. I also think um, like in terms of identifying more metrics and recognizing people, I think it would be amazing if we could figure out a technical solution to make a leaderboard of the number of project application reviews yes. that are done. But that's the same thing. <clears throat> it's a leaderboard of reviews, not of how many applications you have, right? We don't need more projects. Um, the other thing I want to mention is um, Node 2396865. It's a meta for finding issues to work on is difficult. Um, it's related to another meta that is finding issues is difficult. <laughs> um, they're slightly different. But on one of the child issues of this is, um, is issue 2219493. Add a search for issues with patches that touch certain file types, like JavaScript or CSS. Um, so we c if we can improve our search tools, then we can do a better job of matching up people with things to work on. And anyway, I know we're out of time. But we are. We are. Uh, two break. minutes past. <laughs> 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 and I hate to keep you all away from coffee. <coughs> you can probably go to the next slide. It has the sprint thing. Oh. Yep. And by the way, go to the sprints <laughs> <laughs> on Friday. <laughs> We need to find out who these two people are in this picture because we keep oh, using this picture. Well, not. Lucas is. Oh, you mean other than Lucas? Isn't he? Yeah. Oh, no, it's not Lucas. That's Camila. Camila with expertise. Your, your doppelganger that's almost Lucas? Yeah. <laughs> we, so we should find so out anyway. who they are and ask them that it's okay we keep using the picture because because it's a really good it's like a perfect picture for like the mentoring and the sprinting and stuff and just like make sure it's okay that they don't feel weird that All like right. we start using it everywhere. It's my own little so, to myself. So with regard to the sprints tomorrow and finding issues that are important and relevant to all of the things. Um, I said this in the last session too, but we're trying to do a triage of the major issues that are in that are outstanding in core. There are like almost 900 of them. Um, if you're someone who has some experience contributing to core bef previously, um, but you're looking for a way to get more involved and, and help with this issue discovery problem of having lots of old, stale, irrelevant, hard to search stuff as noise in the queue, um, come. Like when you come to Sprint Day, because you're all coming to Sprint Day, obviously. Um, when you come to Sprint Day, look for the major triage table that Kalpana is going to be leading, and I'll probably be nearby. Um, Chris Selefin here also um, is leading the Sprint. And the goal is to go through the major issues in the queue. Um, so by, by virtue of being major priority, they're already, to your point about finding things that actually matter, um, they already, someone thought that they were more important than you know two-thirds of the stuff out there. So that's a good way to know that something, at least at one point, mattered. Um, I encourage people to come help help out with that tomorrow. Um, Friday. Fri oh, it's Friday. Is it night? It's Wednesday. Yes, Friday. Okay. You can come out tomorrow, too. But um, uh, how out of time are we? Maybe. We're like totally out of time. I don't think we're five minutes minutes in this room after us. Yeah. Okay. Three minutes. Okay. Thanks, Kathy. Um, so, and Hussein, you said that you, you like to work on the base system queue. So the base system is very scary and I was going to like not even include it in the triage. It's the it's the component with the most major technical debt outstanding. But if you are already working there, it would be fantastic if you wanted to like lead a team to do that at the major sprint. If you if you don't have another goal for Friday already, that would be really awesome. But it requires that you are willing to do something that doesn't result in patches. But this is the point that, that Kalpa and I talked about is that you are gonna get 
credit for in the issue when the issue is if the issue is eventually committed and like some uh, certainly a proportion of them will be you're going to get credit like we don't we can't surface it immediately on triple.org yet but you will get commit mention in the commit message for doing like posting a substantive comment that summarizes the issue whether or not it's still relevant fines related stuff like if if you act you're doing this this triage exercise isn't just clicking buttons it involves research and thoughtful thinking about specific problems and that's that's a part that's work that deserves commit mention and so um, so I've been committing patches to Drupal 8 for about a month now, and I credit reviewers on every single thing I commit. There's, I mean, it's like substantive reviews, like when, when someone, and not just not just code review, like if someone does design work, they deserve to be credited in the patch for that issue. If, if someone does usability review, they deserve to be credited in that issue. Um, and, and we're going to do that for the triage sprint as well. So you, <coughs> if, if that recognition is one of the motivations for you, um, please come to that. I, I was going to address more of the point about not crediting patches specifically, but I don't want to babble <laughs> since everyone probably wants to go have coffee. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, and thank you. This session is awesome. Yeah. All right. um, thank you. And then, of course, do the whole go to the page and it's fill out the evaluation. Four, thing four, four, one. Yeah. There's been a couple of mentions about project application. I want to put a little advertisement out for David's session at 5 today. He's going An to be talking from about now. Pro talk. Project application process. Uh, if I'll you're interested if in that and seeing improvements there, there, it's yet another area that needs improvement. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.